Uh, for the next 30 minutes, though, we're going to dig into Acts chapter 13, and we're going to actually see a church that had an incredible impact on the kingdom, okay? I'm going to try to explain some of it, and you can be praying and trusting that the Holy Spirit would apply the truths and the implications of the gospel to your own heart as you open yourself up to what he wants to say to you through his word this morning. Sound like a plan? Okay, that's where we're going. Okay, here's the setup. So far in the book of Acts, uh, what Luke has recorded is basically that Jesus has shown us that he's in heaven and he's in charge. Okay? He's on the throne. He is the king over the entire universe. And he's at work accomplishing everything that he's accomplished right now. Okay? You see, it, it, it goes down in the, in the book of Acts exactly like Jesus said it would. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said to those who had come to believe in his resurrection, uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the end of the earth. In other words, God's on a mission to rescue men and women and to restore everything in this world that's been broken by the curse of sin and he's invited you to be a part of it. Okay? Rick Warren said it really well in his book, Purpose Driven Life. You were made for a mission, he said, and God is at work in this world and he wants you to join him. He wants you to join him. What happened, though, after Jesus left? He gave that promise and then he took off to heaven, right? Like, well, through the Holy Spirit, he empowered men and women to go out into the world and to show and tell how incredible and awesome he is. That's what he did. And to live a new kind of life that's shaped by the gospel and, and his promises and his grace. The good news begins to spread all through Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the, these Jewish men and women who give their lives to follow Jesus. And what did it do? It immediately brought conflict, okay? Opposition. From who? From religious people. Religious people who lived their lives trying to prove how incredible and awesome they were. And that hostility, you see, uh, began, they began to persecute these first followers of, of, Je of Jesus, these Christians. Stephen is killed. Uh, we saw James is killed. Last week we read that Peter is thrown into prison and he's ready to be killed. Many of the Christians in Jerusalem and Judea had scattered throughout the Roman Empire to escape and to start a new life. Did, a question, did that ruin God's plans? Nope. <laughs> no, no. Jesus redeems their suffering. And, the, and, and through the good news that they carry with them, the Holy Spirit begins to change the world because ultimately Jesus Christ is the one who's in charge. And Jesus Christ is the one who is glorious right now. And Jesus Christ begins to change the world through the gospel. The gospel is unstoppable. The gospel begins to cross every barrier because the gospel is for everyone. Persecution and suffering become the means by which these original Jewish followers of Jesus, they become this diverse, multi-ethnic community of disciples on mission with the gospel. They're bringing grace and hope to the known world. And the flagship church of this movement, it's not in Jerusalem, it's 300 miles north in Antioch, in Syria. Barnabas and Saul are at the church. Barnabas and Saul, they, they, you'll, we saw last week, they went uh, at, down to Jerusalem uh, uh, for, to care for the needs of people because of, there was a famine. But now they've been back at Antioch. They're serving this church that was born because normal people filled with the Holy Spirit were willing to open their mouths and they were willing to love people outside of their ethnic and cultural boundaries. And so what happens here in Acts chapter 13 is critical for you and me because the Holy Spirit prompted this church family to keep their focus outward. Okay? They didn't get consumed about marketing uh, the first church in Antioch. They didn't, they didn't make the focus of their faith about their comforts and their preferences. And, and no, they didn't do that, you see, because being on mission, the mission that changes lives forever, was more important to them than their individual success or their retirement plans. They focused on getting stronger out there. And what this church family does is it opens up this whole new section in the book of Acts, this whole new section in the story of how the gospel changes the entire world and history and makes it all the way down here to you and me today. And now we're ready for chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a close friend of, friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, I, I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but I, I, what I don't want you to miss is the diversity of these men and God's heart for diversity in the church and unity around the blood of Jesus Christ as a family. This is being put on display here in Antioch, this first church. This is cultural 
ethnic geographic diversity among these men who are leading and serving this church family. Jew, Gentile, dark-skinned, light-skinned, African, Middle Eastern men together in a family. Verse 2, as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, these guys in particular, they were fasting, but the church, it's likely they were fasting for the Lord to give them clear direction, you know, like what are we doing and, and where are we going as a church? And what I've learned over the years is that the strategies and the practicalities of that question are not found in this book, okay? I mean, there's theology and there's principles to be rooted in when considering vision and direction and strategies for the church, but the Bible doesn't tell us which one of you we should send out of this place, right? The Bible doesn't tell us who we should partner with and who we should lead and and, and who should lead and and where we should go uh, plant a church. The point is that these guys were hungry for God's leading and so they come together and they seek it. And guess who said? The Holy Spirit said, verse 2, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there, they sailed to Cyprus. By the way, why would anybody want to leave this church? Uh, This church that clearly was the Lord Lord was at work, and why would anybody want to go somewhere else? Honestly, I've been at this church family for 23 years. There have been times that I've tried to leave. There have been times that I was so thankful to be able to get to stay here. Most of the time, I've been holding that with an open hand. God, uh, it would be hard But let me and my wife be willing to go if that's what you're calling us to do, right? But why? Because why? Because our lives aren't about ourselves. They're about the glory of God and about his kingdom. They're not about my comfort and and my safety and my security and my preferences, okay? Why? Why would somebody be willing to leave this church? Because of the mission of Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, Okay? Because of the promises of Jesus. As you go, I will be with you wherever you go to the end of the, right? T- t- till, uh, till the day that I come back. Because of the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Right? Verse 2 says, the Holy Spirit said. Well, how did the Holy Spirit say? Because nowhere do I read in Scripture does it say specifically that Paul and Barnabas should go out. But they understood God's heart. That the word of, the, word of God is for the nations. And clearly the Holy Spirit put it on someone's heart that Barnabas and Saul should go and they were ready to go and and that this church should support them to get the message out to the world. Now, uh, John Piper, he's a former pastor and a well-known author, he once said a few years ago when addressing this passage, he said this, he said, it is almost impossible to overstate the historical importance of this moment in Antioch in the history of the world. Before this word from the Holy Spirit, There were no strategies for missions or missionary journeys. This moment of prayer and fasting resulted in a missions movement that would make Christianity the dominant religion of the Roman Empire within two and a half centuries and would yield 1.3 billion adherents of the Christian religion today with a Christian witness in virtually every country of the world. And 13 out of the 29 books of the New Testament were the result of the ministry that was launched in this moment of prayer and fasting. Wow. Wow. We don't know the specifics, but we do know, what we do know is that these leaders prayerfully confirmed that they believed that it was God's will to set these men apart and send them off to take a step of faith, an adventure to take the gospel out to others. They prayed over them, uh, they asked God to bless their ministry, and they sent them off. There may have been more who accompanied them. What we do know, verse 5 says, a man by the name of John Mark, that's the writer of the gospel of Mark, by the way, was with them as an assistant for a short time at least. From this point on, Luke begins to refer to Saul as Paul, and it's most likely because he was being sent off uh, uh, into increasingly non-Jewish contexts in order to reach the Gentiles with the gospel. And Paul is his more widely known, more widely used Greco-Roman name. For the sake of time, I'm going to summarize the next few verses, 5 through 12. Paul, Barnabas, John Mark, uh, led by the Holy Spirit, they head out and they begin to communicate the gospel starting in synagogues. And whenever Paul goes to a new city, Luke makes it clear that this apostle to the Gentiles, he actually starts with the Jews, his own people, because he loved them. 
the beginning, uh, they begin on the island of Cyprus, which was Barnabas' old stomping grounds, by the way. And it doesn't take long. And what do they do? They run into some opposition. Uh, opposition from a Jewish false prophet. This guy attempts to keep the, the Roman governor of Cyprus, the, the governor of the whole island, from believing the message because Paul and Barnabas are witnessing to him. And filled with the Holy Spirit, they stand up to the opposition. The Holy Spirit does a supernatural work through Paul. They persevere in trusting that God has them as they share the good news about Jesus. And in the end, God is glorified as this governor believes Paul and Barnabas. And Luke writes that he is a, he's astonished by the teaching of the Lord. Now, that's one of the things I want us to notice as we move through this story in Acts 13, is that there's a pattern. There's a pattern. What kind of pattern? You say, well, if we're living our lives on mission, there's a pattern. Number one is communication. Number one is communication. God has some things that he once said. So we open our mouths and, and we speak the truths and the implications of the gospel in love. Number two is opposition. There's no advance of the gospel without resistance. I've got news for you. We have an enemy and the devil wants to stop the gospel with a thousand different methods. Okay? There's communication, one. Opposition, two. Number three is perseverance. Better learn these. We're going to talk about them next week, okay? It'll be a test, all right? Perseverance. We don't put our tail between our legs and give up. We have the Holy Spirit, okay? Number four is fruit. The gospel spreads. Lives are changed. God is glorified. Let's look at the rest of the story through that pattern, and I'm going to comment as we go. Uh, jump down to verse 13. Verse 13. Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John left them and went back to Jerusalem. Uh, we put a map up here for some of you who are, are map nerds like me. I like to see what that looks like. So he left Antioch and went. He's all the way up in Pisidian, Antioch. Uh, and John Mark leaves them. The intern takes off and heads back home. We're not told why. Maybe it was because it was a difficult and dangerous journey. Maybe he needed to go home and let the dog out. I don't know. <laughs> Acts chapter 15. Like, Paul and Barnabas actually got sideways about it. it. It actually seemed to be something that discouraged and frustrated Paul. Okay, verse 14. They continued their journey from Perga, and they reached Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue, and they sat down. Again, notice where they start. It's in the synagogue, first to the Jews. Okay? After reading the law and the prophets, verse 15, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, you can speak. Well, Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and said, Well, there it is. There's, notice the pattern. Here's one, communication. God has some things that he once said, so he gives... Paul, the courage to open his mouth, okay? What does he say? Fellow Israelites, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our ancestors, made the people prosper during their stay in the land of Egypt, and led them out with a mighty arm. And for about 40 years, he put up with them. Other translations say he, he cared for them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. This all took about 450 years. After this, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then, he asked for a, then they asked for a king. God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man from the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After removing him, he raised up David as their king and testified about him. I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart who will carry out all my will. From this man's descendants, as he promised, God brought to Israel the Savior Jesus. Now, do you notice what he's doing to this mainly Jewish audience? He, he's retelling the story of their people. This is their family history, okay? their songs, their prophets, the law of Moses. This is what they knew, right? And in the process, Paul is clarifying and he's helping them to understand and he's compelling them to see that their story, all of it, has always been about the grace of their great and glorious God. In fact, if there were a theme to the story of the Jewish people, it would be that God has always pursued them. He's initiated them. He chose them. He made promises to them. Do you notice that God is the subject of all the verbs in Paul's message? Paul paints a picture of the Old Testament, the old part of the story, and he points to how Everything that they have been hoping for flows into the new part of the story. In other words, Jesus isn't like pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Ta-da! It's not like, hey, all of a sudden, 
whoa, who's this guy? Like, like some guy who's come to rescue us? What? No, it's more like he's a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow, a great treasure, a long rainbow of promises that has been stretched out for centuries. Amen. Okay? Paul, he, he continues to communicate. Verse 23, from this man's descendants, as he promised, God brought to Israel the Savior Jesus. Before his coming to public attention, John had, this is John the Baptist, had previously proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Now, as John was completing his mission, he said, who do you think I am? I'm not the one, but one is coming after me, and I'm not worthy to untie the sandals on his feet. Brothers and sisters, children of Abraham's race, and those among you who fear God, it is to us that the word of this salvation has been sent. Since the residents of Jerusalem and the rulers did not recognize him or the sayings of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled their words by condemning him. Though they found no grounds for his death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him killed. When they had carried out all that had been written about him, they took him down from the tree and put him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and he appeared for many days to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we ourselves proclaim to you the what? The good news of the promise that was made to our ancestors. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, by raising up Jesus as it is written in the second Psalm. Paul, Paul quotes Psalm 2. He quotes Isaiah 55 next. He quotes Psalm 16. And he basically says to these guys, I've got good news for you. When you were growing up hearing about this in Sunday school, well, actually, Saturday school for them, right? The, the old part of the story, the promises, they always pointed to this new thing that God was going to do to make the old part of the story complete. And newsflash, he's doing that new thing right now. I mean, you know where David's tomb is. Like, you could go dig up his bones, but why don't you go try to dig up Jesus's bones? They're not there, right? He's changed everything forever. Don't miss it, he says. Everything that your parents and your great-grandparents acted in faith for and repented for and were hoping for and prayed for, God's doing it right now, okay? He has kept his promises. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Let me tell you why this Jesus thing is such a big deal for everyone. Check out verse 38. What does he say next? Verse 38, Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Forgiveness is incredible, but that's not the half of it. Verse 39, Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. Now, the ESV translation gets at that a little bit different. The Greek phrase says, you are freed from everything that you could not be freed from through the law of Moses. Being set free is an amazing thing. I think we at all as Americans agree with that. Being set free is amazing. What does he mean, justified or set free? From what exactly? Well, what Paul is trying to get across is what you tend to use religion to do or keeping the law to do or justifying yourself to do, it will never do. It will actually enslave you. The law was always intended to point you to God's perfect character and nature to reveal your wicked heart and to drive you to see your need for Jesus Christ. Okay? Because here's the thing, if you understand the gospel, the grace that is yours in Jesus Christ is what will set you free from everything that striving to keep the law will never set you free from. Okay? What, free from what? Jesus can set you free from the guilt and the condemnation of your sin. Okay? Romans 8.1, Paul says there is no more condemnation. 1 John 5.21, John says, Jesus became sin for you so that you could become the righteousness of God in him through repentance and through faith, okay? Which means you don't need to pay for your sin. Amen. You don't need to pay for it. That's what Jesus was all about, which means you can stop living with the pressure of trying to perform to make God happy with you, Amen. okay? You can stop pretending like you have it all together. He knows. That's what this was all about, right? He's not like, oh, I did this for everybody except for you. Jeez. 
right? You don't have to resent God for being so demanding because you know what? He actually bore all the demands for you. He lived and loved perfectly for you, which is why death and hell couldn't hold him, by the way, and he walked out of the grave, okay? Which is why that's the greatest receipt that you could ever hold in your hand. The penalty of sin has been paid in full. You don't have to owe anymore, Amen. okay? You're free, as my friend says. You're free. <laughs> but there's more. You could be set free from the power of sin that rules over you, okay? When you confess your sins and your need for Jesus Christ, and when you believe the truth about him, okay, he sends the presen- his presence, the Holy Spirit, to live in you, and he begins to shape your life and give you the power to actually begin to see life his way, okay? To be set free from chasing after things like hope and, and love and security and happiness and created things and even good things which don't have the power to rescue you, okay? I'm talking about things like friends and, and boyfriends and spouses and, and kids and medicine and vacations and sex and media and productivity and success and on and on and on. The Holy Spirit will teach you. He will grow you. He will strengthen you. He will mature you to be satisfied in all that Jesus is for you and all that he's done for you and all that he's promised you and his great love for you. And that will actually free you to be able to enjoy everything and everyone else in your life the right way without crushing them, without turning them into idols that you you have to have, you're going to die. No, you won't. And you can actually say no to things when they're not God's will for you, okay? But listen, when you're being set free, not not perfectly, all right? None of us in here have this down, right? But when you're being set free, not perfectly, but increasingly from the power of sin in your life, it leads to one more thing, and it's this. Jesus can set you free increasingly from the fallout of sin in your life. What are you talking about, Josh? Josh? Well, I'm talking about the effects and the consequences that come into our lives when we chase after the wrong saviors and when we look for love and security and purpose and hope in the wrong places. And y'all know what I'm talking about. The fallout of of, of our sin in our life is marked by fear, anxiety, stress, depression, worry, addiction, bitterness, anger, broken relationships, divorce, hopelessness, We all get it. We all get it, okay? Before Jesus, I was arrested five times. I was overnight in jail twice. I was in rehab programs two to three times. I could have taught them by the time I was done with them, okay? Maybe it was like four or five times, actually. So I I spent thousands of dollars on fines and things, okay? I would sit there and I would think to myself, it's a whole lot easier to get into trouble than it is to get out of trouble, you know? Like, this sucks, right? Well, what I couldn't see yet was that I was a slave to the wrong masters and I needed to be set free. But here's the thing. I grew up in church and and what I saw was a bunch of people who were enslaved to religion and striving and justifying themselves and performing and pretending. And so this is Paul's whole point. It's that the law of Moses, the best religious system in the world, can't set you free. Well, I don't follow the law of Moses, you say. So what does that old Bible story have to do with me? Well, I'm so glad you asked, okay? Because here's the thing. You live and you act just like the descendants of Abraham do when you live your life believing that you can justify yourself to God in any other way than surrendering yourself to Jesus Christ and receiving his grace, okay? You can't impress God. You can't tip the scales in your favor. You can't find the kind of life that God created you for by just being a moral person, okay, or striving to be good. That'll never justify you or set you free from anything. It'll actually do just the opposite. It'll end up enslaving you, okay? And you know what you'll become? You'll either become prideful, you'll you'll just be judging everybody else, or you'll be hopeless because you know you can't do it and you'll just quit on Christianity, what you believe is Christianity, okay? Your goodness was never meant to rescue you. Okay? Forgiveness and freedom in this life have always come, always come by believing God's promises okay? and humbling yourself and receiving his grace, Old Testament and new. Okay? Paul's trying to get it through to these guys. Freedom is why Jesus came. 1 Timothy 1, 15, Paul says, 
Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, okay? And, and John said in John 3, 17, he said that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came so that the people of this world might be saved, pardoned, justified, set free through him, okay? But I want you to notice this. Be careful because what Paul says in verse 39 is important. He says that everyone who believes, everyone who believes has this. This is why he ends his message with a warning. Verse 40, so beware that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. And these guys knew, this pro- knew the prophets, right? Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away because I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe, even if someone were to explain it to you. Okay, he, he quotes their prophet, Habakkuk, and basically what he says to this Jewish audience is, hey, stubbornness runs in your family, okay? It runs in your DNA, and you better wake up or you're gonna miss out if you don't get on board, okay? God is doing what he's always promised right under your nose. Jesus is the fulfillment of the hopes and the dreams of your ancestors. He is the plan, okay? God's grace is what will change your life forever, and you've been invited to receive it. In fact, I'm inviting you right now, but you're going to have to choose. Do you wanna be free or not? How do you think they responded? Remember the next part in the pattern? What was the pattern again? One, communication. Two was opposition, right? So let's see if that's true. Verse 42. Um, As they were leaving, as they were leaving uh, the synagogue of the Jews, the people urged, they begged them uh, to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. After the synagogue had dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them, and urging them to continue in the grace of God. The following Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord. I mean, that sounds pretty swell, doesn't it? That's like, you know, hey, we can't wait for next week. This is pretty awesome. The message spreads. The whole town shows up. Maybe I made that pattern up. I don't know. Verse 45. You ready? But, oh, there it is. There's always got to be a but, right? But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy, and they began to contradict what Paul was saying, insulting him. Other translations use the word reviling him, okay? So number one, these Jews are ticked that Paul was able to draw such an audience, to gain such an influence so quickly, right? And, 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 and or the, these Jews really aren't pumped at the idea that God's blessing and his privileges and his salvation is just so easily going to be given to the Gentiles? Like, like if those guys get to be saved... That's offensive to our system of performance, man. Like they still have that whole, hey, I, I've got, I, I get to be saved because I grew up in church and I've been doing this stuff for years mentality, right? And so again, it's people getting hostile about grace. Can you imagine that? It still happens today. First, there's communication. Second, there's opposition. What's next? Okay, verse 46, uh, Paul and Barnabas give up. They quit because it was too hard. So they went back to the church in Antioch and they stopped witnessing and they got a new job, right? No, they didn't quit, right? Verse three, perseverance. Perse- I mean, number three, perseverance. Look at verse 46. Paul and Barnabas boldly replied, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, they're like, hey, you guys are in the middle of the Atlantic, you're drowning, God has thrown you the life preserver and you've said, no thanks, I'll swim for it. Since you've rejected God's rescue plan, his grace, we are, what does he say? We are turning to the Gentiles for this is what the Lord has commanded us and he quotes their prophet, Isaiah 59. I have made you a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That's the way this is supposed to have been happening, right? When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced. They were like, yes. This is awesome. So in other words, you guys don't want the good news? You don't want to receive the invitation to experience the restoration of every broken thing? You don't want the hope of the gospel? I'll give it to them. And he turns to the Gentiles, right? In fact, I think we should try this so we should know how it feels, how it went down, okay? I'm going to be Paul. You guys over here be the Jews, and you guys be the Gentiles, okay? And I'm going to ask you guys, do you want the word of God? No, you don't. Do you want the word of God? Do you want the word of God? No. Any of you awake? Do you want the word of God? No. no. Oh, do you guys want the word of God? Yeah. Hey, see, that's how it happened. That's exactly how it went down. 
okay? It's like, okay, fine. Communication, opposition, perseverance. You ready for the results? There's fruit, okay? The gospel spreads. Lives are changed. At least some lives are changed, right? And God is glorified. Verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and they honored, they glorified the word of the Lord, and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Listen, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, like, you have a part in this story, okay? It's one of the reasons that you are alive today, to be on mission. Jesus is at work and in people's lives today through his spirit, and when you and I open our mouths, you know what's going to happen? Some people are just going to walk away, and like, some people are going to be like, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. Some people might call you a fool. Some people might sit and stare at you for years and shake their head like a bobblehead. Uh-huh. But some, by God's grace, will experience the joy of a changed life forever. And you know what? We've been seeing it happening here in this church, praise God. Okay? I can't wait till April. We're going to share some testimonies and we'll have some baptisms in the service. Uh, and just we'll get to enjoy together what God's been up to in our midst. How does this chapter end? Verse 50, Luke writes this. But the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. But Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and went to Iconium. That's where we'll pick up the story next week. <clears throat> and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Now, I love that. Opposition continues and, and even spreads. But Paul and Barnabas, they shook the dust off their feet. Like, they didn't fight back. They didn't get depressed and go sit in a corner. They didn't quit and go home. They, they refused to give up. They, they don't get worried about who's been elected and who's in charge. They don't get bitter, right? They don't spend their days blasting people on social media or overly consumed with the next conspiracy, Okay? What do they do? They continue to live their lives on mission. And no matter what resistance they face, what is it that they have? It's the same thing that all disciples of Jesus Christ are supposed to have. Because Jesus Christ is on the throne and he's in charge today. He's at work. Amen? Amen. He's coming back. Did you know that? They are filled with joy and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. If that doesn't describe what the Christian life should look like, I don't know what does. 